praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Welcome to the Bible Speaks Live. This is Reverend Michael Jakes. I am an associate pastor at Bethesda Church of God in Christ in Brooklyn, New York. Such a privilege to be able to come to you once again with the Word of God. We believe that the Word of God speaks for itself. We believe that the Word of God has a voice. And if you listen very closely and you allow the Spirit of God to deal with your heart, the Bible will speak to you. Once again, welcome to you. Pray that you had a wonderful week. And we're looking forward to the Lord's Day. But until then, we're here once again to bring you the un shackled word of God. We're going to pray and then we're going to go into a subject that's very important to the church today, uh, a subject that is much needed. Uh, and so let's pray before we even go any further. Heavenly Father, Lord, we bless your name tonight. Lord, we thank you for allowing us to be in your presence once again, Lord Jesus. Lord, we count it a privilege and an honor, Lord Jesus, to be able to break the word of life, Lord Jesus, to have the opportunity, Lord Jesus, to spread and open up your word to so many at a given time, Lord. So, Lord, we thank you for that. And, Lord, we pray that even now, Lord, those under the sound of your word, even now, Lord, I pray that you might begin to bring them in. Lord, I pray you might begin to gather them, Lord Jesus, even as we speak now, Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray that you might prepare of the hearts to receive your word tonight, Lord Jesus. Lord, we know that your Holy Spirit is willing, Lord Jesus, to touch and to move and to convict every heart, Lord Jesus, under the sound of your word, Lord Jesus. Lord, we know that your Spirit is willing, Lord Jesus, to touch every heart that is reaching and searching out for you, Lord Jesus. Lord, because your word declares that you are not far from any one of us, Lord Jesus. So, Lord, we allow you, Lord, to have your way this night, Lord Jesus. Lord, use us as you will, Lord Jesus. Anoint this word as it goes forward, Lord Jesus. And, Lord, I pray that it might fall upon the hearts that need you as your spirit wills, Lord Jesus. We love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, once again, we want to welcome you to the program. And on tonight, i like to speak about revival. Revival. And the fact that we need revival. We need it desperately. Now, if you would ask many people, they would say that, well, that the church down the block is having a revival or or. This group, this organization, they're having a revival. They're having a week revival, or they're having a, a 10 day revival, or they're having a 40 day revival. And, and, and it, there seems to be revivals going on all over the place. They're being advertised all over the place. People are giving out little pamphlets and little cards uh, saying that uh, there's going to be a revival and inviting people to come. Uh, but what is revival? What is it really? You see, because if you go to a revival service, you ought to be coming out revived. Revived. And so what we want to talk about tonight is what is revival and who is it for and what are the results and how do you know that you need revival? Well, I can start right there. I can tell you that we all need a revival. Uh, we don't need a another service. Uh, we don't need uh, to hear another choir come together and, and and sing and sound good. We we those things are good and those things have their place. But we need a revival, and we need a revival that is personal, that gets into our life, that gets to the root of our problem. And the root of our problem, ladies and gentlemen. The root of our problem is sin. Sin is the root of our problem. How do you know that you need revival? I'll talk about what revival is in a moment, but how do you know that you need revival? Well, we need revival when we see ourselves having a lack of interest in the Word of God. When I don't want to spend time in His Word, when I don't want to read, when I don't want to... Find out what the Lord wants to say to me because the word of God is his word to me. It's him speaking to me. And so even before we pray, 
our prayer need, even before we read his word, rather, our prayer needs to be, Lord, enlighten me. Open up my mind and my heart so that I can receive from you. And if I no longer have that desire to open up his word, then I need revival. If I no longer, if I no longer find a place, make a place in my life for prayer, then I need revival. Prayer is that connection between ourselves and God. We need to have that connection. And sin is the very thing that will cut off that connection. Every single time, sin takes you out of fellowship with God the Lord. And so we don't need for sin to take a hold and a grip of our lives. We don't need it. And so these are two things in particular that if we find ourselves falling into these particular problems, we know that we need a desire. Another way that we know that we need revival is when we have we don't have the desire to be sanctified. Remember what sanctification is. Sanctification is to be set apart. To be set apart from the Lord. And also remember that sanctification happens in two parts. There are two sides to sanctification. Number one, when we get saved and born again, we are automatically, we are sanctified. The Lord has taken us out of the kingdom of darkness and separated us from separated us from that and brought us into the kingdom of light so as soon as we become born again we are sanctified on the flip side of that we also need to know that sanctification is a daily walk with the Lord as we walk every day we have to make choices to do the right thing we have to choose to do the right thing. Yes, the Spirit of God is now in us, and the Spirit of God will motivate us and lead us to do the right thing, but we still have the sin nature within us that cries out for attention, and we fail the Lord many times, and we should seek sanctification. Lord, help me Help me to choose you every single time. Lord, I don't want to sin. And when we lose that desire to be set apart, when we lose that desire to live holy on a daily basis, we need revival. So in those three areas in particular, I could keep going, but those three areas in particular, if we find ourselves lacking, we need revival. Now, when it comes to revival, when I say revival, what exactly, what exactly am I talking about? Well, what I am not talking about is going to a church service where there is singing and where where there is uh, many things going on. And once again, of course, revival is going to happen many times within the church setting, of course. So there's nothing wrong with that. But what I'm saying is... Revival has be, is between you and God. It is between you and the Lord. There are many different definitions of revival that I have heard over the years. And I, jot a, I jotted a few of them down. One says that revival is that sovereign work of God in which he visits his people. It is a return to spiritual health after a period of decline into sin and broken fellowship with God. That's what happens when sin begins to take over our lives as Christians. We, our fellowship with the Lord is broken. So it is for, it is for people, God's people, when they need to be forgiven and restored to life, spiritual health and vitality. So, there you have, in a nutshell, basically what it is to be revived. And make no mistake about it, revival is not for the unsaved. Revival is not for people who are not Christians. You see, the reason for that is because of the word revival itself. It's to bring back to life. It's to bring back to life. And so, the reason why... It's not for the unsaved. It's because 
those who are spiritually dead cannot be revived. Those who are spiritually dead, speaking about unsaved people, they need to be resurrected. And so there is a difference. God's people, because we have been given life, when that life that we have been given begins to be pulled away, in a sense, because of sin, then we need to be revived. Our life needs to be brought back again. And that is what revival does. Now, when it comes to the unsaved and revival, evangelism or telling other people about Jesus may flow from revival. Because when I become revived, once again, my eyes are going to be open to the lost. My eyes are going to begin to see that people need Jesus. I'm going to begin to be burdened for those who don't know the Lord. And I will evangelize. I will evangelize. And, and, and that is another, that is the fourth reason why uh, we need revival. When we begin to lose our desire to see the lost come to the Lord. When we lose that fire and we lose that passion, we need revival. We need revival so much. And so, I don't want another service uh, as far as that goes. I, I, I want to meet the Lord myself. Personal revival. And when it comes down to revival is going to happen and revival won't happen until we, on a personal level, become broken. When we become broken, broken. Brokening is that softening of the heart. It's that softening of the soul. It's the breaking up. It's the breaking up of any pieces of resistance in my life that say, this is mine. This is this is me. And, and, and this is what I want to keep for myself. You see, we as Christians, sometimes we have toys. We have little toys that we hold on to. Little trinkets. Little things in our life that we refuse to give up. And we hold on to them for dear life. And we feel as if we cannot live without these things. Unless these things leave our life and we become broken, we will not, we will not see revival in our hearts. You see, in order for our hearts to be revived, the roof, the roof has to come off of our life. And the walls must come down. The walls must come down. You know, I heard someone say, but rather I read uh, someplace, that revival is not when the roof comes off. Revival is not when the roof comes off the building, so to speak. Revival is when the bottom falls out. You see, I need to be broken before revival can come. Before the Lord can give me life, I need, I need to know that I have that need. I'm going to get back to brokenness in a bit. But I want to bring you to scripture right now. And I want to bring you to uh, the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms speaks very definitely about revival in several places. And I want to go over several of these passages that speak about revival. Revival. In Psalm 119. In Psalm 119 and verse number 156. Psalm 119 and verse 156. It says, Great are thy tender mercies. Great are thy tender mercies. And then, it goes on to say, it goes on to say, Revive me according to thy word. Revive me, quicken me, quicken me. That means revive. Great are thy tender mercies, O Lord. Quicken me according to thy judgments. You see, it's the word of God that's going to the word of God that's going to be the catalyst. It's the word of God that's going to be the thing that's going to bring revival to my life. When I see the word and when I hear the word and when I understand what he has spoken in his word, I will begin to obey it. And I will cry out for this thing called revival. Great are thy tender mercies. Quicken me. Revive me. 
bring me back to life according to what you have spoken. According to what you have spoken. And this should be the cry of our heart. Lord, revive me. Revive me. Bring me back to life. Lord, show me where I lack. Show me, Lord, where I need you. Lord, I need revival. In Psalm 119 and verse number 37. Psalm 119 and verse number 37. It says, Turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity and quicken me in thy way. Quicken, that's that word, it means to bring back to life. Give me life in this area. Lord, turn away my eyes from looking at things that don't matter. Turn away my eyes from seeing things that don't mean anything. And, and spiritually speaking, Lord, turn my heart away from those things that don't have any any sense of meaning in my life. And Lord, let me just see you. Let me just know who you are. Let me just know you. I don't want to look at or behold vanity anymore. Lord, quicken me in your way. Notice that it says in your way. Lord, I don't want it to be my way. Lord, give me life according to your way. If I had it my way, I wouldn't even want to be revived if I had it my way. And man and churches and people, we have a way of bringing revival that suits us. It's a way of revival that looks right and looks proper and it feels good and it's energetic and it may be even entertaining, but is it God's way to true revival? Is it God's way to the revival that we really need? And we have to go to the Word of God to see what the Bible says about real revival. In Psalm 119, once again, in verse 88, Psalm 119, in verse 88, it says, Quicken me, that's revive me, give me life, after thy loving kindness, so shall I keep the testimony of thy mouth. You see, he says, look, if you give me life, if you revive me according to your mercy, according to your grace, then I know that I'm going to keep those things that you have spoken. You see, that's what revival will do. It will rekindle a passion for the Word of God and give you the heart and the mind and the desire to obey. To obey. And as we talk about rekindling, several years back, I was praying. I remember where I was when I was praying. And the Lord just put this subject of, he just put this subject of revival in my heart. And he began to speak to me even as I was praying. And he, he gave me four words concerning revival. And he, he gave me these four words. And, these, and, I, and I took the paper and I tucked it in my Bible. And I just keep this piece of paper that, I, that God, he gave me these words for what revival is. And, and I just hold it there and, and I present it to you right now. The Lord spoke to my heart and he says that revival is a rekindling. It's a rekindling. In other, in other words, it's a reigniting of a fire that has gone out. When the fire, when the zeal, when the passion of the Lord has faded out, you need revival. It is a rekindling. And it only takes a spark. It only takes a spark to get that fire going. So our prayer is, Lord, Lord, give me that spark. Lord, set me ablaze. Lord, put that passion back in my heart, in my life. Lord, I want to see you. Lord, give me life again. Give me life again. The Lord told me that revival is a, is a recapturing. It is a recapturing of that which has been taken. You see, the devil comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. Never forget what the devil does. And one of the main things that he does to those who are unsaved when they hear the word and to those who are saved and hear the word and know the word, 
his job is to snatch the word of God out of people's hearts. And Lord, I don't want the Lord, I don't want the enemy to have a sway over my life. I don't want him snatching the word of God out of my heart before this word can take a hold of me. Lord, recapture. Lord, help me to recapture what the devil has stolen. And that's what revival will do. Revival will help you to take back those things that the enemy has taken away, has managed to take away. He takes away peace. He takes away, as we said, our desire uh, for uh, the word of God, our desire for prayer, our desire to be holy, all these things we spoke about. He takes away, he snatches these things out of the Christian's life. And we become weakened by it. It's a recapturing. The Lord told me that revival is a refocusing. It's a refocusing upon Christ. You see, here's what it is. And if we have time, we'll get into this a little bit more as we go along. Revival is a refocusing on Christ and the cross. The cross. You see, the cross is where Jesus paid for our sins. The cross is where Jesus sacrificed his life for us. And it's that same cross that we need to understand that is that we need to keep our focus on when it comes to our sanctification. How do you live a holy life? How do you live a holy life? You live a holy life by placing your faith in what Christ has already done for us on the cross. He purchased my salvation. He purchased my redemption. I'm sanctified, I'm justified, and I will be glorified. And that's all because of what Jesus did on the cross. You see? So, when revival happens, it's because I have refocused on the cross. You see, in Revelation 12, 11, it states very plainly, they overcame him. Talking about Satan. They overcame Satan by the blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Lamb. How are you going to overcome Satan? How are you going to win against the devil? By focusing on the blood of the Lamb. Jesus' blood on the cross paid it all. It did it all. It bought our salvation and it also bought our sanctification. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives unto the death. And so we need to keep our eyes ever focused on the cross of Jesus Christ. Focused on the cross. And revival is a refocusing on that cross. Finally, number four, revival is a releasing. It is a releasing from the things that bind us. It is a releasing of us from bondage. Sin brings bondage. It brings definite bondage. Let me bring you to the book of Acts. And this is uh, the book of Acts in chapter number 20, I believe. Acts chapter 20. There's an interesting story uh, there, which, when you read the story, it's 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 a very captivating story. But the outcome of the story led to a great revival. Let me start from the beginning of the story. Uh, it says in Acts chapter twenty and verse number thirteen. Acts chapter twenty. And verse number 13, starting off, it says, Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, and these were Jews who were, these were Jews who were actually exorcists. Uh, they were not Christian. They were not religious in any way, shape, or form, but they were exorcists. They went around trying to uh, supposedly uh, exorcise demons from individuals. 
and they took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, what were they doing? They said, look, we have seen Paul at work, these, these Jewish exorcists who did not know the Lord themselves. They said, look, we have seen Paul in action, and we have seen his disciples in action, and they say the name of Jesus, and, and people are delivered, and people are set free, and the demons come out of them, and people get healed. We've seen it with our own eyes. When, and it only happens when they say, in the name of Jesus, and all these great things happen. You know what? If we use the name of Jesus for what we do, we will have the same results. This is what they thought. And so it says, they would use the name of the Lord Jesus saying, we adjure you. We adjure you, or rather, uh, that simply means, uh, that simply means we, we, we command you. We command you in the name of Jesus that Paul preaches. It says, we command you in the name of the Jesus that Paul preaches. You see, they couldn't say in the name of Jesus for themselves because they didn't know Jesus. They were not acquainted with Jesus at all. They were not born again. And they're trying to use Jesus' name as a fix-it, as a fix-all. Listen, Jesus will not allow his name to be used in a second-hand way. If you don't know Jesus, if you don't know him for yourself, then you need to, in a sense, keep his name out of your mouth. Unless you're calling on him for mercy and salvation, you need to keep his name out of your mouth. And they decided that they were going to try and use the name of Jesus to do what they wanted to do. In verse 14 it says, and there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and chief of the priests, which did so. So they all decided that they were going to do this. And they did it. And in verse 15 it says, The evil spirit, the evil spirit that was in this particular man, spoke to them and said, Jesus, I know. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, the devil, demons, evil spirits, they know who Jesus is. They know very well. And the Bible says demons know Jesus and they tremble because they know what Jesus can do to them can do to them and will do to them and is going to do to them. So they fear the name of Jesus. So the demon says, Jesus I know, and and Paul I know. Paul I know. I'm acquainted with Paul because he has the power of Jesus in him and he uses the name of Jesus and, and we have to run. We have to go. So they were acquainted. The demon was acquainted with Paul also. And then they say, but who are you? Who are you? You see, the seven sons, the chief priest and the seven sons of Sceva did not know Jesus for themselves. And so now we have a problem. You see, ladies and gentlemen, what it comes down to is if the devil, if the devil does not know your name, it means that you know him too well. It means if he's not acquainted with you, it's because you are acquainted with him. Got to think about that one. Because you see here, it says that Jesus, the, the demons knew Jesus and knew Paul, but the seven sons of Sceva, because they did not have the power of God in them, they didn't know them, they didn't mind them, they didn't care, and they were operating on their own recognizance, on their own power. And you yourself, apart from the Spirit of God, apart from the power of Jesus, you are no match for the devil. I am no match for the devil. But it's because... It's because his spirit is in me. It's because his power rests in me that I have power over the forces of darkness. So he says, who are you? Who are you? And verse 16 it says, And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them. Leaped on them. Why did the man jump on them? Because he was not afraid of them. Because they had no power. They had no, they had, they had not the Spirit of God in them. 
And the man with the evil spirit was able to overtake them. It says the evil spirit leaped on them, overcame them, and prevailed. That means he won. And so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. So the priest and the seven and his seven sons, that word wounded means that when they left there, they were hurt. They were hurt. They needed medical attention when they left there and they had to run out. The man who was possessed stripped them of their clothes and beat them down badly. Seven men. But the man was possessed. That's why he had power over those particular men at one time. And it says in verse 17, what I want to get to is, this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus. And it says, fear. Fear fell on them all. It's talking about a great reverence because they now they understood. Now they truly understood the power of the Lord. Not yet they understood the power of Satan, but they understood the power of the Lord. And they understood that the, the power of the name of Jesus. You see, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. You see, if we're going to see revival, the name of the Lord Jesus must be magnified. And I know we think we are magnifying his name when we come to church and we and we shout and we dance. And once again, all of these things have their place. They have their place. It is good. There is nothing wrong with it in their proper place. But we need to magnify the Lord. We need to magnify his name. Lift him up. Lift him up. The Bible says, if I be lifted up, he will draw all men unto him. But we got to lift him up. We have to magnify his name. In verse 18, it says, many that believed, they came. Now notice, it says, many that believed. Now, when the Christians, the ones who believed, when they saw what happened, when they had a, had a, uh, a reawakening of the power of the name of Jesus. It says that they came and they confessed. And they showed their deeds. They confessed and they showed their deeds. They had a, they had a coming out party, so to speak. What did they do? The Bible says here that they brought their their curious arts because where they were living in Ephesus it was a place where witchcraft was being done and many of the people that had gotten saved had come out of a life of witchcraft but some of these people who had gotten saved were still dipping and dabbing in certain things and they were, as we said earlier, they were still holding on to some trinkets and, and stuff that they had in their life that the Lord was not pleased with. And so they brought these things after having seen the power of God at work. They brought their curious arts and their books together and burned them before all men. And it says that they counted the price of them and it was 50,000 pieces of silver and mightily grew the word of God and prevailed mightily grew the word of God and prevailed why because people were revived they brought their things their stuff and they laid it down and they burned it how does that translate for us today we need to take our stuff we need to take our baggage we need to take the hidden things of the heart. We need to take the things that don't belong and we need to take it and we need to set it on the altar so that they can be burned up. Then we will see revival. Revival. Lord, I surrender. Lord, I give you my stuff. What stuff? Just the stuff about me that's not good. The attitudes the temper, uh, the little things that in my own mind, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Whatever I don't think is wrong is probably wrong. 
I need to give all of these things to him, to him and to him alone. alone. Those would be the results, the results of revival. I'm going to, I'm going to give my sin to him and let him take it for himself. I'm going to let him take it. Psalm 85. Psalm 85 and verse number 6. Psalm 85 and verse number 6 also talks about uh, revival. Revival. And in that particular psalm, it says, Wilt thou not revive us again, that they, thy people may rejoice in thee? You see, revival, the rekindling, the revival, that we're talking about, that rekindling and that refocusing and that releasing and that recapturing is going to bring rejoicing. It's going to bring back the joy in our hearts. That joy. You see, sin is gonna sin sin takes joy away. Sin takes the peace of God away. But revival, revival changes all of that. You see, revival is going to give me an awareness of his presence. An awareness of his presence. That I know that he's there. An awareness. It's going to give me a, a responsiveness to his word. When I hear his word, I will respond. I will act upon his word. When I am revived, I'm going to have a renewed sensitivity to sin. Are you sensitive to sin? Are you sensitive to sin in your own life? I remember years ago, I remember years ago, uh, I was at the job, and when I first started at the job, I can remember that there was a vending machine in the cafeteria. And in that vending machine, you know, you have the potato chips and you have the candy bars and you have the little, the candy, you have all these things there. And I remember that uh, someone had used the machine and the item came down, but they left their change. There was change to come out and they left their change. This was years ago. This is years ago. And they left the change. And, and I put my finger there, and they had already gone. I don't even know who was the one that had done it. But when I saw the money there, my mind immediately said, it's not yours. Don't take it. Because the individual might come back. The individual might come back, and they might say, where's my change? And so it was just, I don't even remember, it was, it was a quarter or something like that, or a couple of quarters. Now, what would be the problem if I took the quarter, just put it in my pocket and walk away? You know, your loss is my gain. Ha, ha, ha. No, no. I, I, I had a sensitivity and I said, no, no, I, I, I'm going to leave that there. They, they might come back for it and they, they need that. And several years later, several years later, same job, same vending machine. I recall the same thing happening again. And this is several years later, five, six, seven years later. And I reach in, and there's change in there already. I take the money out, and I say, oh, oh well. And I put it in my pocket. And I'm gone. Something happened. Something happened in those, in the two people that one didn't take the money, and the other took it. Both were me. You see, there was a, I lacked at that particular moment in time, I lacked the sensitivity to sin. And I took the money. Now, was it wrong to take it? I don't know. I, this is, I'm talking about me personally. It may have not have been anything wrong with it, but I am giving you a contrast between my mindset and my heart set in two different occasions with the same thing happening. The first time, I didn't take the money. I left it there. The second time, I just picked it up, put it in my pocket, and walked away like it was nothing. 
You see, there was something that was going on in the heart that there wasn't a sensitivity to sin. There was a hardness that had taken place. And if you don't deal with any, if anyone does not deal with sin in their life, if you don't deal with sin in your life as a Christian, sin will harden your heart. If you don't allow the Holy Spirit to deal with you, if you turn your back on the Spirit of God and don't obey, sin will harden your heart. Harden your heart. That's rebellion. That's why, that's one of the reasons why we need revival because of rebellion. Rebellion. You say, but we are God's people. We are God's people. We don't. It, it's not as bad as you say. I beg to differ. Because I know what it says in Second Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14. It's a very familiar scripture. Second Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14. It says, and I'm, I'm going to break it down in a few minutes that we have left. I'm going to break it down. I'm going to break down this verse. It says, if my people Number one, it's God speaking. God is speaking to who? God is speaking to his people. We are his people. He is not talking to unsaved people. He is not talking to people that are not Christians. He is not talking to people that don't have any, uh, any reason or idea or desire to serve him. He is talking to his people. If I'm saved, I'm his people. If you go to church, you may not be his people. If you sit in church every Sunday, and you say amen, and you clap, and you sing, and you shout, and you dance, you still may not be his people. His people are those who have his spirit living on the inside. Living on the inside. So he says, if my people, number one, who are called by which are called by my name. See, we carry his name with us. His name. We are people of the Lord. We are children of light. We are Christians. We carry his name. So he says that my people, which are called by my name. Okay? We have, we, we, we have a great name that we need to lift up. And we need to treat it properly. He says, if we shall, number one, Humble ourselves. Humble ourselves. Come down off the high horse. Stop thinking that you don't need help. Stop saying that everything is all right. Stop thinking that you don't need revival. He says, if you humble yourself, if you get down, if you get low, humble yourself, see yourself like you really are. Not like you think you are. If you need to see yourself like you really are, he says, humble yourself. He says, number two, he says, pray. Pray. Many Christians, many Christians have forsaken the place of prayer. No, no, no. No, 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 Pastor Michael. No, how could you say that we have forsaken the place of prayer? We pray. Christians pray at church. Christians pray at church loud. People pray at, Christians pray at church loud and long. But that is not the mark of someone who prays, just because you can pray in church. Prayer, the Bible says that we ought to pray at all times. So it's not just when you pray at church, in church. It's not just when you come in and get on your knees when you walk in and pray. It is your life. Is your life a life of prayer? prayer. That means you pray in your house. That means you take time to pray on your job. I'm not saying you go into a room at your job or whatever, but once again, pray at all times means that you are always in an attitude of prayer, ready to pray anytime. So if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face. You see, there's a difference between praying and seeking his face. Pray 
is when I'm, I'm saying, Lord, uh, uh, it, it, it's, Lord, I need you. I need you. Seeking his face is a little, it, it, it's deeper. It, it goes deeper. And here's where we, here's where we slack off. You see, our prayers many times are very surface. Our prayers are sprinkled with very high sounding words. Our prayers are sprinkled with very theologically sounding words. Lord, you are sovereign. Lord, you are you are the great sanctifier and the, you are the Lord of our salvation. Our prayers sound very religious. But we need to get deep with the Lord. Seek his face. Seek his face. It says, and turn from their wicked ways. What's that you say? His people? God is saying that his people need to turn from their wicked ways? The word wicked means evil. Do you mean that Christian people need to turn from their evil ways? Christian people have evil ways, Pastor Michael? Absolutely. Christian people have evil ways. Some of the most wicked and evil people that you will ever meet are church people. I say that honestly and truthfully because there are certain ways about certain people that are, quote, church people or people who are Christians who say they are Christians that they are just mean-spirited. Mean-spirited. And he says that we need to turn from our wicked ways. And some of the wicked ways are some of the things that we spoke about earlier. Not having that desire to pray and to read. and to, All these things are part of the wicked way. But we also have certain things about us that are wicked. How we speak. How we behave. How we think. Our attitude. All of these things are part of our wicked ways. The things that come out of our mouth. The things that don't come out of our, our mouth that should. All of these are the evil ways that God's people have. And we need to own up to it. We need to own up to these wicked ways and say, Lord, yes, this is me. This is me. This is how I am. And until we can recognize, until we can recognize our need, then we will never be revived. We will never, ever see revival until we can honestly say, Lord, I need you. I need you. We got to recognize. We got to recognize our need. It says, turn from their wicked ways. When we do that, when we humble ourselves, when we pray, when we seek his face and turn from our wicked ways, when we do those four things, he in turn he says that he will hear from heaven and he will forgive our sin and go so far as to heal the land. Heal the land. The healing of the land happens after God's people get right with God. After we lay down our sins, after we stop saying that we don't need the help that he can give us, after we become humble, after we become contrite and confess, as the people in the book of Acts do, did, and as, as we pray, the Lord will come, will forgive our sins, and then there will be an outgrowth. From sin, we will begin to, as we said, evangelize. And that's when the Lord will begin to heal the land. But we got to recognize the need. Unless anyone recognizes their need for the Lord, they will not receive the help they need from the Lord. We need revival. We need revival. We need for our fellowship to be brought back. We need for that broken fellowship to be restored. We need our spiritual health and vitality to be brought back. This is what we need. This is what we need. The Lord has to do it. 
And why not start with me? Why not start with you? You see, salvation is personal and revival is personal. We need to become broken before the Lord, broken before him, broken. Because when we become broken, it means it means that our self-will, our self-will begins to crumble. Everything we think about ourselves will begin to crumble when we become broken. Broken. Lord, take my sin. Take my sin. Take everything about me, Lord, that's not pleasing to you. Lord, I give it to you. Lord, no matter what it is, Lord, I take it, Lord, take it and remove it from my life. Remove it from my life completely. Completely. So send I you, the, the song says, so send I you to labor unrewarded, to serve unpaid, unloved, unsought, unknown. You see, to bear rebuke, to suffer scorn and scorning, so send I you. To suffer for my sake. You see, you see, there there will be suffering. There will be things going on in our life as we uh, yield, as we yield to God's hand in revival. But He will be with us nonetheless. He will be with us. He will walk with us through the journey. So how about you tonight? How about you tonight? See, brokenness is going to be the entrance into life. Where are you tonight? Do you find yourself, do you find yourself in a place where the passion is not what it once was? Do you find yourself in a place where the word of God is not important as it used to be? The place of prayer is not what it used to be? Uh, you, you don't uh, find yourself living or behaving uh, in a holy manner anymore and the passion to be that way is gone? That means you have no peace. That means you have no peace because as a Christian, your heart's desire is to please the Lord. And when you begin to lack those things and you begin to slack off in those areas, your peace will subside. And you know when you're slipping and you know you need the Lord. Focus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. See his cross. And you will begin to have a taste, a taste of revival. You got to lay it down. You got to lay down the sin. As the book of Hebrews says, lay down the sin that so easily besets us. Because we tend to drift. Lord, Lord, I need your revival. I need your revival. We're going to pray. If you find yourself tonight and you need revival, you need to be brought back to life. You need the life of the Lord to be restored. Maybe you've even backslidden. You've, you've walked away from the Lord. You've, you're not serving him as you ought to. You're not serving him like you used to. The fire has gone out. Then you need revival. You need revival. We're going to pray. Pray with me right now. Lord Jesus, I come to you right now. Lord, someone under the sound of your word right now needs you, Lord Jesus. Someone who has heard these words tonight, Lord, is in a place in their life where they've fallen off. They've fallen off. They're no longer serving you as they ought to. They are no longer uh, praying as they ought to. The fires have gone out in their life. Lord, I pray that you will begin to restore that life even now, Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray that even as you have brought conviction to their heart right now, Lord, I pray that you might begin to speak to their hearts, Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray that you might begin to have your way in their heart. Lord, and I pray that you might bring them back, Lord Jesus. Lord, your word declares that you are married to the backslider, Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray that you might take their heart Take their life, take their very soul, Lord Jesus, and meld it, bind it to yourself, Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray that you might continue to speak to their hearts, Lord Jesus. Lord, you see where they are. Lord, you know what they're dealing with. 
Lord, you see the sin, Lord Jesus, that has beset them. Lord, you see the ways of the world that has begun to circulate around them. Lord, I pray that you might have your way. And Lord, we know that the devil is a liar. Lord, you break every chain. Lord, you loosen every fetter. Lord, I pray that anyone under the sound of your word right now who is struggling, Lord, I pray that those chains might be broken right now in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray that you, Lord Jesus, might have your way. Speak as only you can speak. Deliver as only you can deliver. Set free as only you can set free. Lord, and revive. Lord, revive as only you can revive. Lord, we don't want revival that man can bring. Lord, we don't want another song. Lord, we don't want another choir. Lord, we don't want any of those things per se. Lord, we want to hear from you. Lord, we want to hear your voice. Lord, we want to be touched by your spirit. As the woman, Lord, touched the hem of your garment. Lord, we touch you now, Lord Jesus. Lord, because we know that you have the words of eternal life and you have the power that we need to live out this life as we ought to. Lord, have your way. Have your way, Jesus. Lord, have your way. Lord, bless your people as we seek to please you, Lord Jesus. Lord, Revive us, Lord Jesus, that we might rejoice in your name, Lord. Have your way. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, praise the Lord. You know, if uh, if you don't have a church to attend on Sunday morning, we invite you to join us at Bethesda Church of God in Christ, uh, Upper Room Outreach Ministries. We are on the third floor. Our service starts at uh, 11 o'clock, and I know that you'll be blessed. Uh, we have great music, and we also have a word that goes out that we believe uh, will touch uh, your heart. Uh, that's every Sunday morning, every Sunday morning. And I also invite you to uh, ask you to invite someone to listen on these Thursday nights. Uh, all you have to do is download the TuneIn app. You download the TuneIn app, and when you get there, uh, you type in the search box, Original Live Radio, and there we will be. So that's download the TuneIn app to your smartphone and type in Original Live Radio. And you can listen in at any time, at any time of the day or night, you will hear singing, music, and the Word of God being preached. So once again, this is Reverend, this is Reverend Michael Jakes. And once again, it's been a blessing to be with you. And I pray that you will join us. Come into your homes with... The Bible Speaks Live. May God bless you.